All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video. Welcome back to the cockpit of 7612 Juliet, the Piper Arrow. It's Q&A time. What are we doing today, do you ask? Why, why am I doing a Q&A in, in, in the cockpit? Well, I'm doing a long flight today. I'm going picking my girlfriend up in Miami. So flying down Orlando to Miami today. I'll probably put the route up on the screen for you. It might come up somewhere over here, possibly. Well, it's all right there, behind the hand. Maybe on the hand. Put out a, a thing on uh, Instagram and a little video asking for your questions and the response from you all was really, really good, so... How big is your what? Oh, flap handle. Whew. Oh, close one. November 7612, Julian, eastbound to prove runway 7, clear for takeoff, wing comp. 75, rotate. Welcome to the sky. No more runway remaining. Gears coming up. No climb out of that. Initial altitude will go up to about 1300 because there's a Bravo airspace directly above us. And then once we get a bit further out, we'll uh, we'll climb it up. Pull that mixture back a little bit. There we go. All right then. Little thing before we start the Q&A, I got a lot of a lot of the same questions asked by multiple different people. So if I put one uh, question on the screen and it happens not to be your particular one that that, that you asked on uh, on a video or on Instagram, then. Please don't be angry with me. I'm sure you can understand. I got a lot of the same questions from quite a few people. So, uh, but with that being said, I think we should crack on with the first question. Tino Telgma. Tino Telgma. I, I do apologise if I'm saying these names wrong. Tino Telgma. Which part of Australia are you from? It's a good start. Just. 10,566.6 miles northwest of Australia. Uh, this is great banter. I'm from Bolton, England. David Miller, 212. What brought you to America? What brought me to America was a Virgin Atlantic 747. Me and my family uh, used to come here on holiday quite a lot, and we bought a holiday home in the year 2000. We used to come here maybe two or three times a year. Really enjoyed coming over here and just enjoyed the, the kind of the atmosphere, the, the kind of lifestyle that we saw. Uh, so we decided that, uh, you know, we wanted to move over here. So we made it happen. Got a question from a patron here. If you weren't aware, I am on Patreon. If you want to support the channel, you can go over to Patreon page. I'll put a, a link to it in the description and there'll also be something in the corner. So Deanna Tickle, great name by the way. She says, I would like to know how you got involved in aviation and how old were you when you started flying? I like this question. What got me into aviation was my granddad. My granddad uh, used to be in the Royal Air Force, which is Air Force in Britain. And when I was a kid, Growing up in England, we used to always go to RAF bases. We used to go to airports, having a look at the different planes and stuff like that. And it was with him that I actually grew uh, a love for, for aviation, a love of planes. Nobody else in the family flies, so it was solely down to him. Unfortunately, he's not with us anymore, but he's always with me every day because I fly every day. So we used to, uh, anytime he used to go and stay, I used to stay at his, uh, my grandma and granddad's house every weekend. So my mum and dad could go out. God knows what they were up to. Don't even want to know. Dad, if you're watching, don't uh, stop it. But yeah, I used to stay at my grandma and granddad's house every weekend. Me and my granddad used to go on flight simulator and fly the big planes and, and enjoy the time on flight simulator. So yeah, it, he's he's the reason that I fly. That's what got me into aviation. Michael Ledger. Uh, Michael Ledger, before we get into this, is an old student of mine, so I'd like to give him a quick shout out. <laughs> The white boy's back in the back to the ventures And you know we kill it cause it's uh, uh, hey! Alright so it's a few different parts But the first part of it, how long did it take you to get your private license? I started flying in 2008 With a company called Orlando Flight Training down in Kissimmee They were a part 141 school And as I went in to do the training and whatever And, and get it started I, you know, I didn't really know much about the process and whatever And put 15 grand down on an account I was kind of flying with, with an instructor. He left, flying with another instructor. They left, another instructor. I went through five different instructors in my in my time there. And midway through 2009, I had to stop uh, because I ran out of money. Soloed a couple of times. I'd done cross-country solos and whatever. But I'd racked up close to uh, 100 hours and not got a private because of the, the messing around from that particular flight school. So that was from 2008 to 2009. I stopped for a long time until 2012 and I kind of kicked myself back into gear and got back into it. Went up to Orlando Executive and met my uh, met an instructor called Josh Johnston, who actually you'll see if you go back to the very first videos on the channel, which are f terrible, <laughs> but go and have a look if you, if you want to cringe. But I met him, best instructor I've ever had. In, in reality, it took me from 2008 to 2012 to get my uh, my private license. Nashim, 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 that's your name, Nashim. Sorry if I got it wrong. 
What is the best advice you can give someone that is starting their pilot journey? Any tips or advice that might be valuable in the long run? It starts with you and your flight instructor. If you enjoy coming flying, if the instructor makes you feel comfortable, if you have a laugh with your instructor while you're doing the training, I think that's uh, the, uh, the best piece of advice I can give you. Find an instructor you get along with. Second thing, don't rely solely on the instructor, okay? I always tell my students to go through and study, study, study at home, and I emphasize the word study. If you're just going to flight lessons and not kind of studying at home and just going in and expecting the instructor to tell tell, uh, tell you everything and, and whatever, it's not going to work. You've got to be an active participant in the instruction process. And that's straight from uh, the fundamentals of instructing. If there's any instructors watching, we're approaching uh, 5,500 feet. I'm going to level it off here. Aaron's Adventure Life. His question is, favourite aircraft to fly and the one you want to fly most in the future? I like Piper Arrow. Piper Arrow's good. Cherokee, Archer. But what I've always wanted to fly is a Diamond DA-40 or the Diamond Twin Star. In future, as far as an airline is concerned, I want to fly a 747. That's the dream. Next question. Swoohoo79, what's the next step for you? ATP? Yes, sir. That's the next step. Mark Schmidt, do you work for a flight school or are you an independent flight instructor? I am an independent flight instructor. Thanks for that, Mark. Next question. Oh, Jesus. This is opening a can of worms. Sal asks, why did you leave the flight school in Kissimmee? Alright, so I've got to think about this and a way to be diplomatic but get my point across. In a nutshell, without kind of going into too much detail and, you know, and whatever, bringing up bad stuff, but I was not happy with the way that some things were done at the flight school. I didn't agree with it. Certain ways that training should be done and when students should be allowed to solo and whatever. And I had quite a lot of arguments with the owner. And at the end of the day, I just thought it was best to go my own way uh, and do things on my own because I'd be much happier and I'd be able to give my students better training. There was another reason that I left. The owner of the company did uh, his best uh, and it kind of worked actually uh, to stop me from flying with Otto. So that's why you didn't see Otto on the channel for a while. Not because me and Otto had a fallen out, but because Otto had a fallen out with the owner. But yeah, I, I, I didn't like the way that I was trying to be controlled in that sense. And that's another reason that I left. But yeah, I just feel like I'm better off as an independent flight instructor now. I'm certainly more free, enjoying myself, giving my students better instruction. So there you go. Are you going to be <laughs> are you going to be flying with Otto more now with the, with the praying hands? Yes, we'll be flying with Otto more. You've seen him. Like a couple of times recently. JGS 007, when are you and Otto getting married? Maybe it's already happened. Ooh. Otto, where's Otto? How big is Otto's channel? Um, yeah, he's got quite a few subscribers. Can you give a shout out? Viewer from Malaysia. Ludix Aviation has made it to Malaysia. Jeepin Lee, welcome to the channel. You've got a shout out. I hope I'm saying your name right. Malaysia. People in Malaysia are watching the channel. That's insane. Anthony. Clear for the option uh, number seven. With you being so pale, how hard is it to prevent yourself from being sunburned when flying? It's as difficult for me to get sunburned in the plane as it is for you to nail your lazy H, you fuck. Ian Cowan from Patreon, another patron. Thanks, Ian, for being a part of the channel. What is your favorite certificate or rating to teach? Private Instruments CFI ETC. Great question, Ian. Favorite rating to teach is instrument rating. Just the technicality and actual instrument flying, flying in and out of clouds uh, and doing the instrument approaches. I love that stuff. Good question, Ian. And thanks for your support on Patreon. What is the most worrying thing about instructing? Another fantastic question, Ollie. You're awesome, as your name suggests. Sending a student solo for the very first time. That's the most worrying thing. Think about it. You uh basically endorsing a student's logbook saying that they are they're proficient to go and fly fly an airplane well, they will not get into an accident and they're doing it on your certificate if they have an accident it all comes back to you as an instructor on the ground when there's nothing you can do just sat on the ground watching uh, them go around the traffic pattern or whatever that is probably the most worrying thing about instructing for me if there's cfis that are watching the channel maybe comment what you think is the most worrying thing if you agree with that or not jaguar 79 gt Jax, did you have any dangerous situation while flying or even an emergency landing. Regards from Germany. Ludix Aviation is in Germany. We're, we're worldwide. I've never had an in-flight emergency. Let's just get that out there straight away. Uh, you may have seen a couple of videos, which I'll explain in a second, with, with some situations that, that I wasn't comfortable with and kind of took the plane down. Uh, but in no way have I had an emergency yet. I'm sure it will happen at some point. Worst in-flight situation 
The thing that kind of scared me the most is probably with the student. I think it was just a bad day for the student. We were coming to land on final and he started to flare very high. And as we flared, the plane started to stall. And as we stalled, we were coming down to the runway. Uh, and we kind of went off to the left of the runway over the grass area. And I had to step in and like, I cannot tell you the kind of feeling that I got in my stomach. Because uh, I thought we were going to smash into the grass and break the plane and whatever. But I jumped in full power, nose down to regain the airflow. So I pushed the nose down, we kind of gained some airspeed over the grass and kind of really, really unstable. And then we kind of climbed away. And air traffic control uh, kind of came over, over the frequency and was just like, yeah, good job. Uh, there was another situation a long time ago on the channel where I took off from Orlando North, a private airstrip, and I got some engine roughness. And I just took it straight back down. I did a, uh, took power off and kind of took it back to the runway, the opposite runway that we took off from. Bents 5000, underpants or boxer shorts? Yeah, 100% it's got to be boxers. Cause I don't like underpants, they're too tight around my thighs. Also, they, they go up into my groin when I start walking. What the f How do you feel about the current state of CFI pay? Do you think it's enough to live on? Alright, first of all, you can live on CFI pay, but there's a, a big asterisk next to it. Let's take a, a, a general day of flying or, or a flight block, okay? Usually two hours. Let's say you arrive at eight o'clock with a student, okay? It takes about half an hour to pre-flight. By the time you've got in the plane, maybe that's another maybe five, ten minutes or so. Cool. That's about 40 minutes of time that you as an instructor have gone to work, but are not getting paid for it, right? And let's say you're making $25 an hour. Let's say you go flying for like uh, an hour, just over an hour, let's say. That's, uh, that's $30. You're getting paid a total of $30 for that block time that you've spent with that student. Split that up in the, into the two hours that you've been there, you're actually making uh, $15 an hour. Quick mess. Which really, for what we do, and uh, the amount of responsibility we have as flight instructors, I don't believe that is good pay at all. Uh, I mean, yeah, you can live on it, but you've got to do more hours and more hours and more hours. The other thing as well is you'll find a lot of flight schools advertise the flight instruction prices, but they will take a cut of that from the flight instructor for them doing no work. So I don't agree with that. To kind of sum it up, yeah, you can live on it. You're not going to thrive. You're not going to be rich or anything like that. You can just about get by on it. And that's what I was doing when I was at a flight school. Ren Jane, any advice for a newly minted pilot? What should I do besides flying for and enjoy being a pilot? My kind of philosophy, the, the way that I explain things to my private students, the private pilot's license is a license for you to go out and learn. And bear with me on this one because you're thinking to yourself, well, we've already learned throughout the training. Well, yeah, you've learned with an instructor by your side most of the time. Now it's time for you to take that private license, get out and fly and experience things on your own. Because when you've not got that safety net next to you, everything becomes a lot different. You learn so much. Uh, I would say fly as much as you can, that's my advice. Will Crowther, I know you're from England because I sent you a shirt. If you were a curry, what would you be? I'd be a, a Vindaloo because in the cockpit, I'm always hotter than the sun, I'm always sweating and stuff. And if you leave me in here for a while and I start smelling like a Vindaloo anyway. So, ba dum ba. Fozzy Bear wants, are you spin current? What's your outlook on spin training? Great question, Fozzy Bear. Being current? In the United States, in the F with the FAA, you just have to have an endorsement, so I am current. Whether I'd be proficient at spins is a different question. I've not done spins since uh, I was training for my uh, CFI, uh, which was close to two years ago. But as far as what's my view on spin training, I feel like it's uh, neglected. At least here in the US, for the private, you don't have to do a spin. You just get taught the theory behind it and whatever. I feel like if a, if a student is exposed to a spin, what it feels like and how to properly recover from it, that's what we should be doing. But then again, you've got aircraft like this one. You, this is spin approved. The only spin approved ones that I've ever been in are uh, Cessna 172s. So not everybody trains on a 172, so it'd be difficult to implement that from the FAA. I think everybody should be exposed to a spin at least once. How many pages uh, in your CFI notebook? How long did it take you to write? Love the vids, keep up the awesome stuff. Thank you, keep up the watching. We appreciate it, Cookie Man. It's not a notebook, it's a fucking massive folder. I'll put it on the screen now. It took me a good few weeks to, to do, but I was going on it solid and, and writing it all out, and it's all my own writing. I didn't buy it from uh, from anywhere, but that's how big it is. Louisa! Oh, she's my friend. Okay, if you don't know who Louisa is, which you probably won't, but you've seen her in a video before, I'll put her right here. There she is. Hi, Louisa. You're closing. Bless you. It was on a sneeze. I felt it on the back of my fucking neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's <funny. laughs> Who are your favourite people? Pilots, obviously. You're not a pilot, but you are one of my favourite people. Okay, I do, I do like you. What do you think about Colombian people? Love Colombian people. My girlfriend's Colombian. You're Colombian. Juan's Colombian. What's your dream airline to work for? Good question. 
Virgin Atlantic. That's who I want to fly for. Nathan Rover, what's your take on the pilot shortage? Is now a good time to try and start flying professionally? Absolutely. Everybody is hiring. The amount of people retiring outweighs the production of pilots at the moment. It's good for people like me who's going for the ATP soon and getting a job. I've already been talking with an airline and, and they're keen to, you know, they're offering all these big bonuses to, to sign on. You know, everybody, all the airlines are competing for, for pilots, so it's a great time to do it. So that's a good question, yeah. Do you recommend PPL holders to get a CPL or CFI before getting into the big stuff? So here's the thing, to be a CFI, you have to have your commercial pilot's license. To get to ATP, you need to have your commercial license. So you've got to go through private instrument, get your commercial, and then I'd say go on to CFI before going to an airline. It's the best way to build hours, unless you get lucky and find like an aerial survey job. B Singer 339, just curious to know if you're instructed to build up hours with the goal to get a job with the airlines. Yes, I am. Next question, MCO Spotting HD. How many hours do you have? I have just passed 1,350 hours. The FAA requires 1,500 before getting a full ATP, so I'm closing in on it. Uh, are you getting your MEI add-on soon? That's your multi-engine instructor add-on soon. Can we expect multi-engine training videos in the future? So I'm not getting my MEI. I'm not gonna be a multi-engine instructor. I will, however, be doing my multi-engine uh, rating pretty soon. I will be recording it, so you will see that at some point soon, but I'm not getting my MEI. Yolk or stick? Yolk all day, every day. I don't know, there's something about it that, uh, that I prefer. Not a fan of the stick. I think Otto's a fan of the stick. Otto might be a fan of the stick. What's the most common mistakes you see students and how can they avoid them? Forgetting your fundamentals of flying. Private students, at, at, at least. You know, straight and level, doing turns, climbs, descents, using outside references, using the horizon and stuff like that. I always find that they'll keep the nose high, they'll keep the nose low, they won't reference the horizon, the head will be inside the plane most of the time. And as a private student, we're mostly, v well, we're, we're all, all the time with VFR. You know, if you see the nose too far away from the horizon, pull it up. If it's too far above it, push it down, use that horizon. As an instructor, it's really kind of hitting a bit of turbulence because of this uh, cumulus cloud next to us. Um, as an instructor, it's really frustrating to see that because that's such a fundamental thing. Darren Foley. Oh, here we go. Can you descend as fast as Bolton Wanderers from the Premier League with a bit of a winky face, you cheeky b****? Bit of context for the people that don't know. Bolton Wanderers is the football team that I support. Uh, in England. I'm from Bolton, it's my hometown team, Bolton till I die. We were in the Premier League, which is the top division in England for, for a long time, and then we went out of it. And we've not been in it for quite a while now, and Darren thinks he's funny bringing that up. Can you descend as uh, fast as Bolton Wanderers from the Premier League? Well, Darren, we descended just as fast as I can descend on your mother- Calm down. Any tips for a new CFI? Don't be like Darren. Give your student an environment that is fun. I can't tell you how many instructors I've had in the past that have made me feel uncomfortable, that have made me not want to be in the cockpit with them, and it stops learning. Most of all, let them make mistakes. After all, we all learn from mistakes, don't we? Advice uh, for a CFI in training? Yeah, make your lesson plans. In my opinion, don't buy your lesson plans, okay? Because you, you can buy them. It gets all the information in your head as, you, as you're typing it out or whatever, and it gets it all in your head and you've structured it your way that's good for you, using what we call the building blocks of learning, going from simple to complex. It kind of verbalize your way through everything. Imagine that you're in the plane talking to yourself through maneuvers. Okay, we're doing, uh, we're doing a stall. Okay, why do we do a stall? Okay, well, we do it because of this, such and such. How do we do it? We set up for a power off stall as if we're coming into land. You'll start to see relationships between things as you kind of verbalize it. So, Luther the lightning bolt. What things can I do at home? In order to minimize the amount of money I spend on training, study at home, do a home study course, buy like Lime Sporties, uh, Shepherd Air, even King Schools, they've got a good system, uh, even though it's old. That's gonna minimize the amount of ground sessions that you're gonna have to do. Uh, I'm an instructor that doesn't believe in forcing ground uh, upon people. Uh, again, another reason I'm doing things independently. You know, part 61 doesn't have an hour requirement, like an hourly requirement for doing ground school. So study it at home and uh, get the written test done as soon as you possibly can. Would be interesting to hear um, the different challenges for PPL students, instrument students and CFI students. Okay, um, PPL students always struggle with kind of doing things on their own. They get used to having a safety net next to them. So let's say they're doing communication and there's something that they, they don't hear quite right. They'll initially turn to the instructor and look at the instructor as if, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? The point of being a pilot or the point of, of flight training is the instructor wants you to do things on your own. So you've got to take the steps to do things on your own. So the, the private wants to uh, have the handheld 
all the time. Instrument guys, maybe they've been flying for a little while uh, on their own and they've kind of got out of things like doing checklists. Sometimes they struggle with getting back into that. When you're under the hood, simulated IMC or in actual IMC, you have to visualize what's going on outside of the plane while you're not looking outside of the plane. And that's what I see a lot of people struggling with. So commercial students, not really struggling much because I think commercial is an easy rating. CFI students struggle with that same thing that I just talked about, verbalizing the way through uh, as you're doing maneuvers because it can be distracting. If you're trying to talk to a student and actually perform the maneuver at the same time, it's, you know, it's, it can be quite difficult. Next question, Carlos Alberto Lucio Montenegro. Great name. His initials spell calm. Nice, like it. If a few student has a little reduction in hearing ability, could he have problems in the medical examination? What are your recommendations with that? The FAA have standards for how your hearing should be. I think it's something like the guys that examiner's got to stand six feet behind you or whatever and say something and you've got to hear it or something like that. But let's say, you know, you've got hearing difficulties. You can see a professional and see what you can do to, to help it out. And then you can get a statement of uh, demonstrated ability, a solder. So if you can demonstrate to, to the FAA that you can still fly the plane safely, that you're a competent pilot, even with a little, little bit of hearing issue, then you're going to be golden. So I'd look into that. Ryan McElroy, brother, sister reunion. No, he wants to come flying, actually. So I've got to get my sister back in, uh, back in the flight. Flyboy Rog, if you could go back and change anything in your training, either the path you, path you chose, schools, etc., what would it be? I would probably change spending 15 grand and not getting a private license at the beginning of training. To this day, you know, it kind of niggles me with the stuff that went on there, with the amount of different instructors I was given. But at the time, you know, I, I, I didn't know any better, so. We went through it and it happened, you can't change it. But what I will say, if I didn't do those 100 hours before I got my private, then I wouldn't be at this point now, you know what I mean? I wouldn't be at 13.50, I'll be at 12.50. And I'll have more time to go before going to an airline. Do, 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 do. One more question, okay? This is, this is a burning question that I get quite a lot. Coast to Coast Aviation asks this, Jay Schwartz, he lives down in Miami actually, or close to Miami, high wing or low wing? Great question. I'm a low wing man myself. I prefer the feel of it. Feels to me more like an airliner. I find them more stable in uh, in maneuvers. Maybe some people will disagree with that, but that's just what I find. It's my personal personal preference. So I'm a low wing guy. That's where we'll cap off this Q and A. Q and A done. This is this has taken a lot of time to do. This has been good. There's been an hour and a half of, of Q and A. I like it. Nice and smooth. Got some cloud build ups going on. You can probably see from that. I'm gonna turn the cameras off and I'll get you to rejoin me as I'm underneath the class Bravo in Miami going into land at uh, Miami Executive Airport which is Kilo Tango Mike Bravo if you're interested. Thanks for the questions everybody. If you enjoyed us doing this then you should certainly let me know in the comments. Maybe in future you can think up some different questions and maybe we'll get another uh, Q&A video going at some point but for now I'm going to say goodbye and I'll see you when we're approaching Tamiami. All right see you later. Yeah, flying with students, you lose proficiency. So it's good to kind of come up on my own and not fly with a student because I'm actually in control. I'm actually having to do everything rather than talk people through it. It is, we've got approach briefing. We're doing a nine right, seat belts are on, prop. We'll put it full forward, mixture, fuel pump, landing light can go on now. Aircraft stop. One, two, two, and traffic's no factor. If you'd like, you start that left turn direct to the numbers. Roger, left turn direct to the numbers. One, two, Julia, thanks. Uh, three green, down and locked. Coming in, approach speed. Welcome to Tamiami. That landing could have been a little bit better if I'm being hypercritical, but I'm being really critical.